Yeah. Uh, being cooler is better than yeah. Yeah. filming. That's fine. Right. Right. Yeah. I thought I thought it was a heater, and I was like, no, wow. Yeah, yeah. 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 I was with you. <laughs> So, Peter, seriously? Okay, well, I apologize for last week. Uh, it made me to deliver. It was, uh, it was just special deliveries that uh, uh, I kind of made a commitment and promised that I would be there. Um, so, uh, so, today we're going to go through two weeks' worth of material. Uh, uh, I'm on the call next week, and uh, I even said, you know, I'm getting over, but the reality is, I one call next week and I wouldn't really want you guys to miss anything, so we're just going to shove right through this. Um, so, we've been talking about um, postmodern era, and specifically, Mike wanted me to, to attack uh, how this applies to science and Christianity and that application there. So, we're talking about philosophy of science in the postmodern era. So, let's go back again. If the modernist thought what? Was there the philosophy there. There's one right answer and it's mine. Okay. There we go. It's going to direct us in all, in all truth and it will be found through this. Postmodernists. Truth? <laughs> yes. Question mark? Okay. Um, so, so when I'm talking, think of this as kind of a, from a perspective of a postmodernist philosophy. And, and how we got here. Okay. So I want to go way back for a second. Okay. And when we're, when we're talking about science, okay, let's go way back. Because when we think about science, what is it really? It's kind of an application of explaining our world. Okay. It's a, it's a practical application of explaining what's going on here. Okay. Whether that be the sun, the moon, the changes of seasons. You know, why do things fall? It's an explanation. Well, way back we think of you know the old Greek gods, and Norse gods, and all these we call them myths. Okay, and, and so let's tackle one of those. Okay, this this is one of the broad book, and, and uh, you know I think it's kind of a fun one. And this is one of the Norse gods, Thor. You know we're all in Thor now. Um, and so this was an explanation of the changing of their seasons. So Thor gets his hammer stolen. Okay. Uh, and by another god, and then, therefore winter comes. Okay. But Thor then later dresses up like a woman, seduces this other god, and on their wedding night kills him and gets his hammer back. And so now spring comes. Okay. So that's the explanation of changing of the seasons back in that time. Okay. And you think, that's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> Not kind of, this is really? That's the best you got? That's what we're working with here? You know, that's, that's what we got. Uh, and yet, when we think, did really people believe in that? I mean, did people really believe that? Well, yes, we got, uh, and I wrote things up here because, one, in case I would drink, you know, that's not the way this gets it's written, okay? And I kind of like time frames. It gives me a mental image of when this is all occurring, okay? So, Anaxagoras, um, he was forced to leave Athens okay, uh, for disbelieving in the gods, okay, and, and, and because he said he thought the sun was just a, a really hot, bright rock, and so, and not a god. And the moon was just reflecting light. It was another rock reflecting light from that hot rock. And so he was forced to leave Athens because of that, for this belief in the gods. Uh, Xenophanes, uh, again, first student, um, he thought the whole portrayal of, of the gods and, and Homer and different poets, uh, like this Hesiod, uh, he thought they were just deplorable, you know, that because, um, you know, what did the gods do back then? They, they were uh, envious, they had lots of strife, and they, they stole other people's wives, you know. Um, they were, you know, they were jealous of the gods. And he said, uh, that's not, that's not what the gods are. And he was the first one, he was attributed to saying that uh, men create gods in their own image. And he said that if, if gods were, you know, if, if cattle 
were sentient and, and intelligent, and they had gods. They would all look like cows and do cow things. And if horses, you know, had gods, they'd all do horse things and look like horses. Um, and the funny thing is, he actually believed in gods. But he said they don't look, they don't do anything. They don't they don't act like us. They're nothing like us. They're just you know, they're gods. They're better than that. They, they don't have the attributes of man. So when we look at this, so so what do we got you know, here? Is is our myths when we look back at them, is this just bad science? I mean, because real, I mean, as a literal explanation of the changing of the seasons, we're expected to believe that Thor every year got his hammer stolen. Every year it can hang on to this thing by the same God, okay? And that God um, was attracted to uh, you know, some uh, guy who dress up in women's clothing, okay, dress up in drag. Every year, every year he was doing this. He was killed every year and came back to life every year. And then next year, he was once again attracted to a guy in drag. You know, Thor's not, you know, team little dude, you know, or maybe, you know, the hell to look, you know. So, but that's every year. But that's not a very good explanation of changing the seasons. So do we believe that that's exactly what they were thinking, that this was an exact representation of, of that, the science of the changing of the seasons? Or can we believe that maybe this was kind of a, a, a playful, fanciful way of expressing um, something they couldn't understand, and they knew it was a mystery. And so this was an expression of that mystery. Jack Finnegan um, said, a myth is not, then, in the first instance, a fanciful tale, but a symbolic or poetic expression of that which is incapable of direct statement. So perhaps myths were just uh, explanations, expressions of what we couldn't understand, of the mysteries of life. Before we get too critical of that, think about Christianity. Are there some mysteries in life that we would have a hard time just verbalizing? No metaphors, no similes, no, you know, not examples, but express those. Give me one. Trinity. Trinity. How, how express that without using his like or, <laughs> you know what we do? We, we say Trinity. Well, that's a, what does that mean? It means three and one. <coughs> it means triune. Well, we just use three, two different words that have the exact same meaning. We've not explained anything. And, and for an outsider, it's like, yeah, I got nothing here. Does that mean he, like one god ate two other gods, and now, you know, and no, no, it's nothing like that. And then we fall back into our metaphors, you know. So, well, it's like this. It's like a clover. It's like an uncle and a brother, you know. We use all these different techniques <coughs> to try and explain that. And, and then we're back to Thor. Okay, we're really back to, do we, and that's how we're going to be seen in the future, you know. And it's like, did they really think that our gods were clovers, you know? Is that what they thought? So, keep that in mind as we're going through this. Um, so, rather than thinking that, that myths are just bad science, can we think of maybe the science and this is, again, how we would think about this in the postmodern world. But science is just very refined, focused myths. Okay. Um, example of this, in, in kind of more recent age, we take Newton's laws of uh, gravitation, universal gravitation. Okay? It's, a, it's something falling, the gravitation working on something falling, okay? in, in essence. Okay? And that worked for a long, long, long time. Uh, it, it, all of our physics that, that surround you know, Newtonian physics, etc., and all the other things that he did uh, really worked very well until we got further instrumentation, further understanding, and then we had more things, data on the table we just couldn't explain. It's like, wow, what's this? And so we, we came up with this quantum theory, okay? quantum physics, quantum mechanics. And then we were able to tell a better story. We were able to gather up some of that data off the table that we didn't have before. And so we used things like 
like forks to explain the story. Okay. Blue moths. Okay. Uh, all this other, these, these words okay, to tell a story that was a little better story. It didn't make the last one wrong, but it fills in more blanks than what we have. And so that Newtonian myth okay, versus the myth that we have right now, which will, no doubt, because there are still, there's a lot of data left on the table there. There's conflicting, when we look at uh, quantum physics and the mechanics, it, it works for this one, it works for this, and then there's aspects of it that are just in conflict. We know there's conflict there still. And so it's not a perfect, it's not perfect, but it works. It works for us very well. We send them into the moon with that. Um, another example of that is like, we think of, you know, when we first think about H2O, what do we do? It's almost like a tinker toys. Okay, that was our first example of this. You know, we got, we got an O, you know, a little block, and we have little sticks, and we put an H here and an H here. Okay, and and then as we got further and further along, we became more sophisticated, more sophisticated, more sophisticated, and we have the orbital theory with this. And I looked it up last night to see if things have changed in 30 years since I took this because I have no need of taking organic chemistry anymore. But I looked it up to see. And I'm amazed, even, even the nomenclature is like, oh, that's different. You know, and I had to, I had to listen to a, one of those YouTube things to understand what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, because the nomenclature was just totally different. In 30 years, uh, the way it looked, the way we were described, absolutely different. <laughs> and so these little neat or orbitals, you know, theoretically, the probabilities are that, that it might be beyond, you know, just this, you know, the, the electron buzzing around in this area. This would be the probability is that maybe this one shoots out to San Francisco. All of these things, you know, can't happen. But just to say that this is more of a myth than science that is going to be retranslated and improved on in the future. And so that's that's kind of the postmodern take of where we're at. Um, well, let's start from where that came from. You know, science, um, we, we, we described to Sir Francis Bacon, although there are many ones that preceded him, but they, they weren't Western, so they don't count. <laughs> 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 um, and then he wrote something called New Organon. And, uh, and part of this was inductive versus deductive reason. Again, deductive, you know, we think of Sherlock Holmes, and we, we have a theory, and then we jam the data to that theory and it falls apart, that was not the right theory. Versus, that's inductive. Um, um, versus, I'm sorry, indu deductive. Inductive reason, we, we start with data, okay? And we go from there. So from this, we develop the scientific theory. So which, which is, in essence, we've got, we've got a question with one answer. We look at what's going on in the world. Um, and from that data, and we pose a question and, and we call this a hypothesis. Okay? So then when we pose this hypothesis, we gather data to try and support that hypothesis and do some tests perhaps. And then from that, then eventually we form our theory. Okay? So that's that's a scientific method. But it assumes a couple things. One, it assumes that we can be unbiased. You know, that we can look at that um, either in our questioning, in our, in our data, how we look at the data, and we are unbiased. And it assumes that we are going to come to a, a definitive answer, a final definitive answer. And, and so that, that was very appropriate when we were looking in the modern age. Okay. Karl Popper, and I have him up there, 1902 to 1994, uh, stated that the very questions that we bring to this, uh, bring to that data are going to color everything that we do. So if if our worldview is one of uh, um, you know you know pro-life versus you know pro-choice, the questions that we have with that are going to color that data. Uh, any question that we have in science okay, is going to color that data and, and frankly create bias. In the, even in the questions that we ask. Um, the, uh, 
Second thing, he said, the question is whether we could ever come to a final answer. Okay. For instance, uh, back in the 1500s, the theory was that all swans were white, because they'd never seen a swan that was not white. Okay. So it would seem like an appropriate assumption that all swans were white until they discovered Australia and saw black swans. Okay. Well, what happened? They just didn't have data. So to assume that you're always that you will that you have this very moment all the data that would ever exist. Okay. You know, we can smile and say, well, yeah, why didn't they understand that? It just wasn't clear at the time. It's not clear. And so, unless you are assumed that you have every bit of data that could ever exist, you don't know. That's not a final answer. It's what you have. It's, um, it's basing on everything that you have off of the data that you have. Not that we stop trying, but that uh, we're only good as the data we have to possess. Sean, you yep. actually see that show up in archaeology. Uh, a standard statement in archaeology is absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Right. Uh, because we recognize in archaeology we are still working with less than 1% of the known total cities and sites in the Middle East. And so having that refined understanding of just because we haven't found it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And so there is that shift that we're seeing. And that, you know, again, when we look back to the modern world, modernist theory, you know, yeah. we got one cup, we know what's going on, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we find one pillar, this is, you know, we can extrapolate and, and know what's going on, or eventually we will. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, and then finally, Karl Popper rejected the logical positivism that, uh, that, that basically says that only the things that a person can observe uh, and can test uh, are true. And we, we talked a little bit about that a while back, you know, that, that even that statement uh, cannot be tested. So, you know, kind of fell apart. Um, Thomas Kuhn, uh, kind of, you know, when we think of Kant as kind of the father of the postmodern world, um, his was like an umbrella. Okay? The things that he said, um, every discipline kind of falls underneath that in the postmodern world in some, to some degree. And so you have philosophists, okay, you have behavioralists, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists um, in their own field. So kind of in, in the field of science, uh, Kuhn was, was really the guy underneath that umbrella, underneath Kant's big umbrella. He's the guy in science. And he was, he was actually an ethicist. Uh, no, he was actually a, uh, was doing his PhD work in physics and then became an ethicist. And so, uh, and wrote uh, uh, the, kind of the landmark book, Structure of Scientific scientific revolution. Um, fascinating book, you know, uh, put your big boy pants on when you, when you read it, okay? Uh, because he is a physics uh, background, a strong physics background. And so, uh, I'm not saying it's for everybody, and I'm not saying that most people can't read it, you can. It's just that some things are going to be more meaningful than others if you don't have a physics background. Let's put it that way. Uh, but basically, he was saying that um, science operates according to uh, a paradigm, okay? the dominant paradigm of the time. Okay? And he said that there is not one paradigm that is better than the other. A lot of it just has to do with a lot of different factors, uh, some of which is who's in control, okay? mm -hmm. the political factors. That. We're struggling with that right now. And when we, when we think of the whole Darwin evolution thing, what's, what's taught in the schools? Okay? Well, who's in control? Okay. Uh, and he even said that initially there was some implication to that effect that, that 
the one was not better than the other. It took so much heat for that, so we kind of softened it a little bit in the second version. But uh, uh, so some of, the, some of that's, that is what he was trying to say is that. Uh, so when we give some specific examples, like back in the 1500s, okay, the major astrological paradigm was that you know the Earth was the center of the universe and everything circled around the Sun, and everything stars, everything circled around the Earth. That was the dominant paradigm. Uh, in the uh, 1800s, uh, the major physics paradigm was Newtonian. Okay? And since that, we've kind of moved on. Um, and in the 20th century, the dominant biological paradigm was actually, it was obviously Darwin. Um, but let's think, why did he say that? Why did he say that one paradigm is not better than the other? One scientific uh, theory or paradigm is not better than the other. Think about applying, trying to apply um, the uh, quantum mechanics to the 17th century. Okay, how useful is that? Okay, they have no tools, no instruments to measure anything that would be very useful at all. Newtonian does it beautifully, worked beautifully until the 20th century. It absolutely worked beautifully uh, until the leaves. So all the questions that they had, they could work out with that. And so from that scenario, we say, which was the better model? Well, is it more accurate in all situations? No. But from a, from a very physical standpoint, it's a better model. Okay? It was the best model at the time for them. And so that was kind of his point. The kind of point is that, that just because something might take more data off the table, more you know, what they call uh, naughty data, things that we can't explain. It takes more and more to fit that back into our uh, into all of our uh, thoughts, okay? And how uh, the testing uh, it doesn't make it better than what came before. But what came before might have worked very very well for them. Uh, you even take a look at the idea of of the solar system. Okay, and, and the universe, and, and actually the Earth, um, uh, with everything circling around it, okay, worked very well for them for, for a long, long, long time. The mathematics they had were kind of incredible mm -hmm. based off that. They could make it work and predict a lot of things with that. So it wasn't just random. It wasn't just a, the church saying this. The mathematicians at the time had this really worked out well. Have charts on this on how that how that all works. So, yeah, Sean. Yeah, like you said, you know, quantum mechanics that work very well got us to the moon. You know, someone in 1530 said, well, the geocentric model works very well. It got us to the new world. Yeah. I mean, we were able to navigate by the stars. How do you explain that? Right, right. Yeah, so it did. It worked. Yeah. Um, Is it possible that you see from when we start saying, well? This is better, we're better, that uh, perhaps we are seeing a bit of arrogance uh, as to who and where we are uh, to make such a point. I think if you, I think, you know, what the postmodern person would say is that um, yes, because, you know, everybody's been wrong. You know, mm -hmm. every theory has been replaced. Um, and eventually ours will too. You know, that's, that's part of it. Is that this is a working theory. It covers a, a lot of data. And Kuhn covers that. He said, how does one, you know, how does one um, paradigm get replaced by another? And that's basically his whole book. Was, how does one paradigm get replaced by another? And goes through all the factors in that. Uh, and so there's a lot of political aspects to this, religious aspects to it, um, and, and what they do is, you know, that paradigm works, and they're just trying to constantly, here's a lot of data we can't figure it out, so we try and jam it in here. That's not working, that's not, well, let's try and figure out how it works, maybe we're not thinking about this right. And eventually they give up, and they say, I, I can't, you know, it's usually, they just, usually it's some young guy, you know, the old guys have already made the reputation on this, so it's usually some young guy who comes up and, and, and says, yeah, that's not working. Okay, let me think of something else outside the box. Think of something outside the box. 
and they go, hey, with this theory, I can gather up that plus a whole another handful of that data okay, that's there, these, these naughty questions that are coming up here. I can jam that in here. Hey, this works better. And then you've got combat, because I've, I've raised my reputation on this paradigm, and you're trying to destroy that, so there's going to be resistance. But eventually, you know, either because this guy dies, or because <laughs> that whole generation dies, and people are latching on that, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's a better paradigm. So, uh, but eventually he might come over, like, and that's happened in, in, in history as well, that people were dogmatic, like, ah, yeah, he's got me. And they, they have to make that shift, because it's obvious. Well, one concern I have is that we as Christians, because, by the way, I understand what you're saying, and I think it's good to recognize the shifting sands of science. That that doesn't get extrapolated to shifting sands of religion and faith. Uh, because there are bedrock things that we can ascribe to and say, you know what? And you're getting ahead of us. <laughs> I'm going to cut you off there because that's all right. That's, this is the background for all of that. <laughs> so we're going to apply this to a Christian yeah. Can you give us some, some examples of uh, naughty data? Because um, you kind of let it sit out before like, if things are left on the table, naughty data. Yeah, um, well, quantum physics, okay, quantum mechanics, things that are seen at, at the, at the uh, molecular level, okay. Um, you know, even this, let's make it really, really simple. Okay. We are in in this universe and things fall down. Okay, what happens out there? You know, what's what's going on out there? Uh, you know, now that we can see everything and everything's going on, there's some things that don't make any sense. Black holes. Okay, why why does that work? Well, Newtonian physics does not explain black holes at all. It, it can't. And and so there's this there's this aspect of of that data that it just doesn't work. On. So now, so now we come up with something else to pick that stuff up and go, okay, this is how it works. Okay, what do we think? And uh, so, but at the molecular level, it kind of falls apart. Newtonian physics falls apart. But we had no way of measuring it. So it would have actually have done us no good back in the 17th century to have a theory like that. Because I can't see it. I can't test it. Uh, and what application do I have for it? Really, you know, in that time, right? you know, we wanted things that can I build a bridge with it. Can I build a better catapult? Uh, can I make a safe cannon? Uh, you know, all of these things are. You know, can I, what are the structure ratios? You know, what the, the, the uh, engineering, you know, building engineering, all of those things work beautifully with Newtonian physics. Uh, but once we hit the molecular level kind of falls apart. So that's that's kind of from a scientific standpoint, it's that's naughty data left on the table that we don't know what to do with. So, um, let's see. so another thing that uh, Kuhn said was we can never be totally objective, okay? And that's built on a lot of facts. Okay? He's not the one that first said that. But uh, so we moved to one of the things that he relied on is Michael. Um, um, and he talked about, and you can tell by the dates that he kind of preceded him, um, and he talked about tacit knowledge, uh, elements of thoughts that are not empirically conscious. Okay, so when we attack data, when we ask questions, this is kind of our subconscious, and we just don't know it. Okay? Uh, so when we apply that to the scientific method, uh, we interpret that data with a paradigm. So we, we start with that paradigm, even when we're asking the question, and that, it, that reflects our, our paradigm and what type of question we ask. Okay, so if uh, one that's very uh, obvious to me that I've seen from both sides in, in medicine, for instance, is like the uh, there's a question that if people who have abortions are they um, they have a uh, um, higher risk of ovarian of breast cancer. So mm -hmm. Breast cancer. Okay. Well, it depends on how you ask that question. Okay. Um, if someone has, if you say, does someone who has an abortion 
have a higher risk of breast cancer than another pregnant person who goes on to, uh, to deliver at uh, 40 weeks. Are the future risks different with uh, 10,000 people? Yes. Okay. The answer is yes. But if I say, does someone who has abortion have a higher risk of breast cancer than the general population? The answer is no. Okay. What's the difference? Okay. So I've, I've almost said, yes, it has something to do with it. No, it has nothing to do with it. That's the question I asked. Okay. Because being not pregnant, I mean, being pregnant decreases your risk of breast cancer. So someone who's had eight kids has a decreased risk of breast cancer just because they've been pregnant for so long. Okay. Um, so the, the, the people who would say yes to that type of question are saying, you know, they are the, the people who say no, you're cheating, okay, because they're not pregnant. So, but you're changing their natural course. It's like saying that that uh, women who have, have you know taken your ovaries out, okay, uh, uh, have different risk factors. Okay, just because someone's pregnant, they are pregnant. They're a pregnant person at that point in time, and so the risk factors and, and decrease of risk factors apply to them. And, and so the negators will say no. No, that's not that's not the case because. Uh, uh, you're comparing to other pregnant women. So, but they're pregnant, you know. So, being unpregnant is changing their natural trajectory. Uh, but how you look at that is going to absolutely change the data and the answer that you get. And this is done all the time in science. And we're in the political season. It's done all the time in politics. Okay? What question are we asking? I mean, you've seen the commercials. Okay? They're just terrible. And, but it's the question you come to the table with that you're so biased, and most of the time we don't know it. Um, and so we, we look at um, you know, that, that, that paradigm that we come to the data with, and we form a hypothesis according to that paradigm. And then we create tests to support our paradigm. And then finally we, we create this theory based off on that data that has been tainted by our uh, paradigm. Uh, and all the while, we don't know what we're doing. As honest scientists, we don't even know what we're doing. And that's, that's what Pollyanna um, was saying. So let's go on to creation. We've got, what this in? Five minutes? Uh, I usually go to 10.35. 10.35, okay. So, you got 10 minutes. So creation and Christianity. Where do we get from all this? Okay, so this is kind of our background here. Uh, first was the Gnostics, and we know about them. Um, believe that matter was evil and and, uh, and created probably matter was created by an evil power. Well, since the early 200s, we've always believed, you know, and, and that uh, uh, that God created the world and created out of nothing. Let's, let's how we start the Apostles' Creed. Okay. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. Okay. So that's been a long time paradigm of the church. And if you do believe that, then the whole idea of Gnosticism should be out the window at that point in time. So then we have pantheism, belief that the world is the same as God. The world is God. The same as God. Then pantheism, okay? that God is, uh, is part of the world, is part of God, I should say. One of the uh, first uh, proponents for this was Baruch Spinoza, so I put him up there. So you see his name. Uh, and then, uh, similar to this, it's a form of pantheism that sees God as evolving and changing as the world changes. Uh, and that was process theology. Okay? And that's Charles Hartsville. Uh, it took a long time. I was looking at that for years. You know, it's an old guy. Just like, uh, for me, it seems like recently, but uh, some of you guys aren't really <laughs> Are you saying you were around in 1897? <laughs> Just ask. Around in 2000. <laughs> so, um, and then and then finally evolution. You know how that's played in, in creation, you know, Christianity and, and creation. Um, so 
What's that based off? Just a quick review of that. It's the you know kind of the essence of that was Galapagos and they had finches and some finches were different on this island than the of this island. You know how they how they get there and why are they different? You know some have you know diggers and you know beaks and some you know fisher beaks and just different. They were different. Okay, and so he was trying to explain that uh, and, and he came up with this natural selection and which then came described as the survival of the fittest. Um, and that was another one. There's like data on the table, okay? Because this did pretty well explaining microevolution. Okay. Another example of this was like in England with the covered moths. Um, before the industrial revolution in England, most of the moths were kind of pale because most of, and most of the bark of the trees were pale. After the industrial revolution, all the soot, all the uh, tree bark became more dark and peppered. Okay. And so uh, most of the moths became peppered because survival of this. You know, early on when their bark was light, all the dark moths got eaten. And later on when they're dark, all the light moths got eaten. And so, so this works really well with microevolution. Um, and so the changes within a genus or species. Uh, and most Christians don't have a problem with that. You know, kind of obvious in a lot of things that that's probably the case. Okay. So most of Christianity don't have a problem with that. It's the idea of macroevolution. Okay. The idea that over millions of years a complex organism like humans uh, have come from something very, very microorganism like. Okay. And so that, that was uh, that's the macroevolution beyond genus and species changes. Um, and um, and so that was some of this data that they covered. And so we developed something called neo Darwinism. Okay? And they latched onto mutation. Okay? And so mutation, we know what mutations happen. Okay? Uh, why are you getting antibiotics that are so expensive now? Okay? But the cheap stuff, the early stuff, um, that bacteria, a lot of you know, for MRSA, those bacteria have were created resistance. Why? Through mutation. Most of the time mutations are bad. They don't cause good things, but every once in a while, at least for that organism, not good for us right now, but for that organism, it's a good thing. It's a resistant organism now um, that is resistant to a lot of our antibiotics. So it's good for that bacteria. Our argument would be, as Christians, like, okay, it's still a bacteria. No, that changed. It's still a bacteria. It's the survival of the fittest. You know, that seems to be what's going on here. And so they have not shown, you know, you know we, we think of that the, the missing link. Okay? They've not found the missing link. Today, they still not found the missing link. So, um, so what is our Christian response? Um, well, we've had scientific creationists okay? um, that arose in the 1970s. Um, uh, and explain, I'm trying to explain some of this. Is that it's more of a fundamental, okay? And there's not a right or wrong here. This is a thought process that we do have seven-day creation, okay? And from the geo uh, sphere, when we talk about layers, and we, look, we talk about layers in like the Grand Canyon, etc., that that was caused by the flood. You know, and so it is you know, uh, scientifically called creationists, but explain science, what we're seeing in the world here, through creation. Intelligent design, so the aspects of life reflected what we call an irreducible complexity that could not have occurred by mere accident. Okay. There's, there's a God. Okay. And that, that, that God is responsible for this because this was, it's obvious, this was not an accident. In the sense of what they're saying. Okay. And, uh, and then finally, a theistic evolution. That they believe in the evolution process, but that this was caused by God. God had his hand on this. Uh, so those would be, I mean, there's other, but those would be the major theories in this uh, in response. At the end of the day, there's some non-negotiables in all of those. Okay, as Christians, we have non-negotiables in the creation theory, mm -hmm. uh, and that is, God created the universe apart from Himself, apart from Himself, and the reality is, He doesn't need it. He is self-sufficient in and of himself. Uh, it's called society. 
God is all-knowing. He has power where he created this. Um, the power aspect that it's all-powerful. Omnipotence. It has knowledge of it, intimate knowledge of what has happened throughout the age. What will happen. Knowledge of what will happen. And omniscience. And that God is involved with this world. And that through Christ, uh, he will make this fallen world and, and make a key uh, through Christ. Uh, finally, and it's been the last four minutes, two minutes, I'm going to do two minutes so we have questions. Um, critical realism, just going to really dot this real quick. Okay? It's, it's another way of how we, as, how we as a science, Christian scientists, deal with what we're, what's going on here. Okay? And apply that both from the biblical research and to applying the, the Bible to our science, to our interpretation of the world. Uh, two things it does. It affirms by faith that reality exists. Okay. Um, at some point in time, to be productive, we just got to believe that we're not a computer chip, you know, manifestation. Uh, and so to actually be productive, we are going to have to believe that this reality does exist. Otherwise, it's kind of meaningless to even think about. And we do not have God's high view of this. Okay? We don't have all the data. Uh, and, and to be... To be thoughtful of that, that we are not going to have all the answers. That's it. I mean, that's critical realism in a nutshell. <coughs> uh, critical realist hermeneutics says four things. The more data, and the more data you can account for, the better the hypothesis. That's mm -hmm. number one. Okay? They seem to be simple, but they're, they're truths. The simplest and most elegant explanation is probably the better one. Always? No, not always. It's complicated and more complicated one, but as a general rule, simpler than that. A logical, coherent hypothesis is better than an incoherent one. <laughs> okay. And finally, a hypothesis that predicts the future data while accounting for past data is preferred. So that's a uh, critical risk for the news. And we have jammed through two. Two weeks worth of this stuff in a real quick time. Questions? Well, I was just thinking about how, honestly, or this, I don't think we should be afraid of this kind of concept. Mostly just because to me it's like, oh, great. We can actually make an argument about why we should be taken seriously in terms of, like, if our viewpoint differs from the world's viewpoint. And, and just, like, and then also the, the fact that we, I feel like this kind of thing is, like, not afraid of having a I don't know. Well, I feel like a lot of the modernists were kind of like, we're almost afraid to say I don't know in terms of like, like this is what we have, this is what we know, this is the answer. Versus like a postmodern scientist would be like, well, this is the data. We don't know why it works, but it seems to work. And here's a the theory as to why it might work. And let's just go with it. And so I feel like as Christians, it's like, this is what we have. We have Bible. This is how like the church has interpreted over the like the years that we've been around. This is what my community of faith believes, and this is how I'm interpreting it. God might be like God might be like, well, you actually have this, this, and this wrong, but I love you anyway. <laughs> and it's it's kind of nice to know like there's like this is what we have, this is what we think, this is what we know, and it's okay if we can't understand everything and we don't have all the data, but God does. Thankfully, you know, and you know, we think, you know, just to tag it on that, we, we often think of postmodernism uh, to a lot of us, it sounds bad, you know. In science, it's been a very good thing, okay. Uh, but I think in Christianity, it's it's a good thing. Not in general, but I'm mean, saying there's good applications to this. This kind of helps us out in some ways, mm -hmm. you know, because it takes away that. Uh, you know, if, if everything in science is absolute, okay, that I know, uh, then they can just discount Christian thought as, as well, it's not this, so anything else is wrong. And so now, you know, and, and even in science, uh, there's this, this openness for discussion of any possibility because uh, they know that we've been wrong so many times. And, you know, I, I brought that up in my, my personal practice and lectures I'm given. So, so even in the, 
this lecture, probably next week. It's probably absolutely a trashy wreck for the lecture tomorrow. <laughs> um, but I've been wrong so many times in the lectures and had to say, everything I told you that, scrap that. Here's the, here's the next lecture. You know? so as far as the data I have on the table, this is what I got right now. I mean, I don't feel like postmodernism, I think we were talking about this earlier, it's not, it shouldn't be like the worldview in which we see everything through, but it can be used as a critique in terms of like, you know, like if we, we have to believe some kind of absolute. Yeah. Because you can't exist without it. And, and, and yeah, to that extent, it's not sustainable. Yeah. You know, there has to be, there's, there are pieces of it that, that we can take an opportunity from. Yeah, it's not a foundation. It's like brakes on a car. You know, yeah. the car is whatever the pulls down yeah. and the brakes. But you can't get in there. Yeah. Yeah. Just the brakes. Yeah. Great job, Sean. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.